Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Arn Schwetman from University of Oklahoma being the guest speaker today for our PQC seminar. So I think Arn uh, is from Germany, right? And he yes. got P a bachelor's degree from Hanover. Um, and then uh, I think the PhD is actually from Oklahoma. And then uh, after doing a postdoc at NIST with Paul Led and Bill Phillips, he actually returned to Oklahoma, joined as faculty, and he's a leading lab now working on cold and physics, political science, kind of said, quantum sensing applications, which is quite interesting. So he will give a talk on entanglement, which is a great word, in microwave dress sodium spanner BC. So the floor is yours. Right. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for the nice introduction. Hello and welcome. Um, yes, as you said, uh, I'm Arne Schwedmann from the University of Oklahoma, and today I want to talk about some work we are doing in uh, spinor bose einstein condensates. Um, our funding currently for the group comes from the NSF via a career grant and DOD uh, via the DEPSCO program. Um, let's see if I can advance the... Yes. Uh, before I start with the proper talk, I want to give a, a quick um, little bit of an advertisement for our Center for Quantum Research and Technology, also uh, called CQRT. We have a brand new state-of-the-art research building with 18,000 square feet of research space, 12 labs. There's a picture of it here, of a piece of it. And this building was built from the beginning um, with NIST A standards in mind on vibration control, temperature, and humidity control. So it will allow us to do very uh, cutting edge experiments in quantum technologies. This houses AMO and condensed matter labs. Here's another picture of it. You can see the new building here on the left, uh, right next to the old physics building. So they're right adjacent. And this makes now our new research complex uh, at University of Oklahoma. So we are always looking for graduate students. So uh, doing uh, or postdocs, please apply. The website is down here, ou.edu slash CQRT. Okay, with that out of the way, let me start the, um, with the outline. So I want to introduce uh, Spinor BEC and some experimental techniques we use to generate the Bose-Einstein condensate in our lab. Then I want to talk a bit about how entanglement is created in the condensate. And then I want to talk about how we control the collisions in uh, the BEC, some uh, experimental results on quantum interferometry, a phase sensitive amplifier beyond single mode dynamics, and then I will end with conclusions and outlook. Please uh, shout if you have any questions during the talk. Um, I think I will also see if you use the chat if you want. Okay, so uh, first let me get started with uh, the, um, of course, how great um, ultra cold atomic gases are as a research topic. Um, one of the examples is, of course, the atomic fountain clocks that are now driving our uh, GPS system to become uh, our time um, standard of time. And of course, atomic clocks also drive GPS to become better and better. And so those are really, uh, atomic clocks are really a big uh, successful example of a quantum technology that has been successful. We can also study optical lattices and try to uh, construct these artificial um, kind of uh, systems that are similar to solid state systems. We can do quantum computing with ultra cold gases, atomtronics, where atoms become the carriers of, uh, of uh, currents, right? We can uh, investigate atom surface interactions, also a very hot topic at the moment. And of course, there's Bose-Einstein condensates and many, many more topics. I am interested in Bose-Einstein condensates uh, for many reasons. And uh, here's some motivation. Um, the, especially the spinner bose einstein condensate is interesting. Um, many things have been studied. For example, these fascinating spin textures and spin waves because in the condensate, the spin is allowed to evolve. Uh, spin dynamics have also been explored in lattices by the block group in, at Max Planck Institute. Uh, Spinematic squeezing and other exotic types of squeezing have been um, observed. Uh, for example, some um, recent very nice work by the, my Chapman group at Georgia Tech we can study massive entanglement by driving the system through quantum phase transitions. This is work by Duan in Michigan and you in Beijing. And we uh, have recently learned that we have precise control over the entanglement creation in the Bose-Einstein condensate via microwaves. And recent, uh, in the last couple of years, this was also explored by Obertaler's group in Heidelberg. I am interested in the system because it allows the field of matter wave quantum optics in spin space. So um, I will try to explain that a little bit later. 
what uh, allows all this nice um, work is the, I hear a question, no, is the uh, s uh, spin exchange collision where two atoms collide and during the collision change their spin uh, and become an entangled pair of um, spins. Um, at room temperature, these collisions are random and not controllable, but in the Bose-Einstein condensate at ultra cold temperatures, these collisions happen coherently and we can control them. This allows us then to do a meta wave quantum optics in spin space. We can use this for atom interferometry uh, with quantum enhanced sensitivity. And I think this uh, platform can be used as a prototyping platform to study quantum technologies uh, such as quantum enhanced sensors and phase sensitive amplifiers. I will have some examples later. Um, but I'm also interested in Bose-Einstein condensates for much more kind of fundamental reasons. And that is of course, because they allow us to explore quantum mechanics in a somewhat macroscopic fashion. So um, this goes back to introductory physics here. We have two realms of physics, the classical realm where everything behaves like you would expect. The apple falls from the tree and might hit you on the head or something. But then there's also the quantum realm where very fascinating and unusual things can happen. For example, an electron in the atom can be at, in two places at once. Um, particles can tunnel through impenetrable barriers and other uh, fascinating things. But the quantum realm is usually uh, only happens for extremely small sizes like the particles inside an atom and so on. A Bose-Einstein condensate then is a quantum gas which is a cloud of atoms that can have millions of atoms that behave like a single macroscopic quantum object which can for example be in two places at once and it can be micrometers in size. I think that's very fascinating and trying to understand this goes back all the way to uh, inve first investigations of light. If we look at light, it behaves like a wave when we send it to a through a double slit, we see patterns on the screen that look just like what you would expect from water waves going through um, such a slit pattern. The waves can interfere constructively and destructively. But light also behaves like a particle. So if we turn down the light source here that um, illuminates the double slit, if we turn it down far enough so it becomes very weak, we will see single clicks on our detector, on our photo detector, which tells us that light is also a particle. And then this question, is it a particle or a wave, of course, spawned the quantum revolution in physics. We don't have to go through the whole of all of quantum mechanics to understand Bose-Einstein condensates. All we need to do is look at de Broglie's idea in 1924 for which he won the 1929 Nobel Prize. De Broglie said at that time already that if light has this dual nature, it can be particle and wave together, then everything should have that um, property. All particles should also be waves. He didn't just say that, he also gave us the um, uh, mathematical expression for the wavelength for atoms in a gas, which is shown here. And the important thing for this wavelength is that it depends inverse uh, proportional to the square inverse square root of the temperature. That means that the colder we make our gas, the longer the wavelength of the atoms becomes. Here is maybe such a wave packet as de Broglie might have imagined it. It has some kind of wavelength, but also some spatial um, confinement here, right? Um, and of course, now we know that such a wave packet is just the um, real part of the complex uh, wave, quantum mechanical wave functions, which, which will tell us uh, the magnitude will tell us the probability of finding the particle. And here is such a wave packet that moves through space. This was an undergraduate homework assignment I had to do to calculate this motion of the wave packet as an undergraduate in Hanover. And it, it really took us weeks to get this thing to move, but finally it moved. So I wanted to show it to you here. So then Bose and Einstein took this idea of, of de Broglie a bit further and, says, and said practically now, what happens if I take a gas of atoms I cool it down until all the wave packets overlap. This is how this might look in a little cartoon. I make the gas colder and colder. Eventually, all of these waves will overlap in a uh, coherent way, and they call this a giant coherent matter wave. So now a macroscopic object that, that is made of atoms but behaves like a wave. This was predicted by Bose and Einstein in 1925, and is since then we call it after them Bose-Einstein condensate. The only issue with this is that um, we can look at the temperature when this happens. And if you look at the temperature when this happens, you, uh, at room temperature, the atoms behave like billiard balls as we cool them further and further down until all their wave packets overlap. 
we find uh, that we have to make this gas really, really cold. We have to go to the nano Kelvin regime, about 100 nano Kelvin or so for sodium, which is the element I'm using. And if you want to see this in degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit, you can see this is extremely cold. The idea how we do this in the lab is then we use the technique called laser cooling and trapping. The idea is that uh, in order to cool atoms, we need to slow them down. Slowing down atoms mean uh, we can slow down atoms by shining light on them because they absorb the light and get a kick. Um, this uh, slowing down atoms like this with laser light is just like throwing ping pong balls, balls at a bowling ball. So here's my little cartoon of the bowling ball. Think of this as the atom, the heavy atom, and our ping pong ball is the photon from our laser light. And this actually works if I throw about 100 ping pong balls. If you don't believe me, you can use your freshman physics uh, mechanics to calculate this using realistic parameters for the bowling ball ma mass and ping pong ball velocity and so on here. This is not quite it because, uh, of course, this will slow down the bowling ball, the atom, but it might also speed it up. So in the gas, the atoms move around in all random directions, and we have to slow all of them down, not only some of them. So this leads to the invention of so-called Doppler cooling, which was invented by Bill Phillips, Stephen Chu, and Claude Contanucci, for which they won the Nobel Prize in 1997. It relies on the absorption and spontaneous emission um, of light. Uh, I can show you how this works really quick we make use of the Doppler shift for this. You might all remember the Doppler shift from the ambulance when it comes for sound. When it comes towards you, the sound is at a higher pitch. By the way, thanks for the random person on the internet here uh, for lending me their ear. And when the ambulance moves away from you, you hear it at a lower pitch. And if you are ever in Germany and don't know what to do to get an ambulance, you can see the number here call 112. The same thing happens not just for sound, but also for atoms and light. So an atom moving towards the light will see it blue, will see the light blue shifted, and an atom moving away from the light will see it red shifted. Now we make use of this, of this Doppler shift to only selectively cool atoms and never heat them up. We do that in the following way. We just red detune our laser light to begin with. So an atom at rest will see the wrong color and will not be sped up. But an atom moving towards the light will see the correct color and the kick get a kick and slow down. And an atom moving away from the light will see it even further red and still get no kick. Now we combine this technique in the magneto-optical trap. We shine light on the atoms from all six directions that only slows them down, doesn't speed them up. And simultaneously, we also apply a magnetic field gradient. You can see that here with the coils here illustrated in this little cartoon, to compress the cloud further into the center. That is called the magneto-optical trap and has become the workhorse of atomic physics since the 1990s. Here is the magneto-optical trap in our lab. Um, inside the vacuum chamber, you can see the sodium cloud uh, cooled in this fashion. The radius is about five millimeter and this is uh, maybe a few billion or so atoms. Here is an absorption image of the magneto-optical trap at OU in our lab when we first got it. And here's the temperature of it, the expansion measured 65 microkelvin. Okay, that's still too hot. So it turns out the recoil limit, because the atoms are absorbing photons, they have, of course, to emit them. And this emission causes a bit of heating. That's called the recoil limit, and that is a few microkelvin. So we need to go much below that to reach the BEC. One technique is the all optical BEC creation, which we use, which transfers the atoms into a far off resonance trap. This is a trap formed by highly intense 40 watt or so in our case, um, infrared laser light that is focused on the center of the atomic cloud. This intense laser light is not being absorbed by the atoms, so there is no heating, but because the electric field is so strong, it still creates a dipole moment from the atoms and pulls them towards the focus, towards the center of the, where the two beams overlap. This is called the AC Stark shift. It's an energy shift due to uh, um, intense light. And if this AC Stark shift is, goes in the right direction, then the atoms seek the lowest energy and go to the center. The nice thing about these types of traps is that there's no absorption and therefore no heating. So we can hold the atoms there. They are not glowing yellow at this point anymore. Here's, by the way, an absorption image of the trap in our lab. 
And then we can cool them further. So for that, we use a very simple technique, which is evaporative cooling. Evaporative cooling is just like blowing on a coffee cup. You selectively remove only the hottest atoms from the, from the ensemble. The remaining atoms are allowed to re-thermalize over time and the coffee becomes colder and colder. We do exactly the same with our atoms. We have them in our trap in the focus of the laser light. We just reduce, slowly reduce the intensity of laser light. The hot atoms fall out. The uh, remaining atoms are left to therm we thermalize to a colder temperature. Eventually, we get them so cold, we have to zoom in. Quantum mechanics starts to play a role. The harmonic oscillator from the trap is, has quantized energy levels. In the lowest energy level, we have the Bose-Einstein condensate, the atoms in the lowest ground state. The other, some thermal atoms might still be around. So then once we have the BEC, we can detect it by turning off the trap, letting the atoms expand. The thermal atoms, the hotter ones, will expand very quickly. The Bose-Einstein condensate atoms are very, uh, stay almost in the same position. We shine resonant light on them, look at the shadow on a camera, and we observe the uh, condensate. Maybe a larger distribution of some thermal atoms with it. Yes, was there a question? No, okay, I will keep going. Here is the uh, image of the first BEC we got a couple of years ago in our new setup here at University of Oklahoma. So here's the thermal cloud, exp which expands quite quickly. And then eventually you get this little dot, which is the uh, Bose-Einstein condensate atoms. Here we have about 20,000 atoms. So we are working with small condensates, but that's fine. Uh, in fact, we, I can explain that later. We want kind of small atom numbers. This is after 10 milliseconds of expansion in a false color image. Here's, I just wanted to quickly show you our setup. So of course, there's a little bit to do. Uh, there's a little bit uh, of uh, thought that goes into this because sodium at room temperature is solid. So you have to heat it up, form an atomic beam. The atomic beam is pre-slowed. Then in our main vacuum chamber, the Bose-Einstein condensate is created. Um, this is how the atomic beam looks. The uh, sodium comes out of an oven here and um, so you, the nice thing about working with sodium is that everything glows in the yellow. So you can see the fluorescence of the atomic beam as it's being hit by the yellow laser light with your bare eyes. The same goes for the magneto-optical trap if you look in the chamber. Um, here is how it looks on the optical table. This long uh, magnet here is just the, it's called the Zeeman slower, which is used to slow the fast atoms in the beam to pre-slow them before they enter the main experimental chamber, which is over here in this picture on the right. Um, here are some other impressions from the lab. I thought since I was going to show it, why not show some other pictures of the laser system, the vacuum system, and so on. So students working in a lab like this um, get a lot of experience in many different things, laser optics, vacuum systems, but also, of course, cooling, plumbing, um, electronics design, all of these things. Okay, so once we have our spinner BEC, once we have our BEC, um, in this case, it is already a spinner because the optical trap, the far off resonant trap, traps all the spin states simultaneously. There is no distinguishing uh, force there. The force is basically the same for all three spin states. Sodium in the ground state is F equal one. That means it has um, three spin states uh, in, along the quantization axis. Let's choose the Z direction. So plus one, zero and minus one. Think of these as just little magnets. So here is an example in the regular BEC that was uh, done in the magnetic traps. Think of the first BECs by Ketterle and, and so on. They were trapped in magnetic traps. Only one, the low field seeker was trapped, only one spin state. But in the our all optical trap, all spin states are trapped simultaneously and overlapping. Now um, we can also detect them, even though they are overlapping, we can image them because they act like little magnets. We can just apply a magnetic field and pull them apart again. This is an image from our lab, how it looks like after we pull the spin states apart. So then we can look at the image, at the shadow, and count how many there are in each state. Now we want to do experiments with these atoms. So we have detection, creation, and detection. Now we want to do our experiments. We do those using a microwave and RF radiation. So we have a couple of antennas in our chamber. You can see them up here. And they allow us to apply microwave control to these atoms. Um, so our home-built microwave antenna is shown here. The uh, control we do is similar to NMR spin manipulation or electron spin resonance, if you're familiar with that kind of technique. But here we use this, these techniques with the BEC. In fact, the control 
um, computer control card we use for that is actually one that was designed for nuclear magnetic resonance experiments, but we can use it just as well for our BEC. Um, the idea is that if we look at the energy levels in sodium, we have two ground states, the F equal one and F equal two ground state. Um, the collisions happen here in this lower manifold and we can couple to the upper F equal two manifold using microwaves at 1.7 gigahertz. Um, one of the things we did is at first we wanted to check this so that we can control many populations. So when we couple these states, we see Wabi oscillations. So the number of atoms in the lower state decreases and increases as, as the atoms cycle back and forth. So this was a measurement to test our microwave control system. We published this in review of scientific instruments this year uh, because it was uh, with the source code so anybody else can also use the system. We can do more, we can control the collisions. So this was controlling the populations, but we can also control the collisions themselves. We do that by detuning our microwave field to do microwave dressing. So if we use the clock transition here, we can uh, have a microwave field that's at 1.7 gigahertz, almost resonant with this one transition, but slightly detuned. What that does is, is creates an AC Stark effect that, um, uh, sorry, uh, it's actually an uh, AC uh, Seemann effect in this case, from the magnetic field of these microwaves, which shifts this lower level here up and down a little bit. So we can control this level, which shifts more than the other levels. And this then allows us to control the collisions and really do experiments like interferometry and other things. So here's again my picture of the spin exchange collisions. Um, so how do we control them? Well, if we look, so the collisions happen here in this ground state manifold between the zero and plus and minus one. So if we go to the pair energy picture, we have the energy of a pair of m equal zero atoms and those collide and become a pair of plus and minus one. If I look at the pair energies, the only difference here is this difference of the uh, quadratic Zeeman shift because the linear Zeeman shift is equal and opposite for plus and minus one and cancels out when we think of pairs. The microwave dressing now allows us to change that quadratic Zeeman shift very quickly and much more precisely than applying an external magnetic field, which requires large coils and is slow and cumbersome to do. So we use microwaves to shift these energy levels. You can see this here for the quench. We start with all atoms in MF equals zero. We put, apply a quench. Now the energy of the pair is above the plus minus one pair and the collisions can start. And then we can also control how fast these collisions happens and so on. Okay, so with that control out of the way, now we have all the ingredients. We can create the ultra cold gas. We can detect these, uh, count the atoms in different spin states, we can apply microwave dressing to control the collisions in time by applying pole sequences and so on. And so we have everything we need to do some real uh, physics. Now I want to uh, take a quick, um, um, I want to investigate here really quickly the uh, difference between doing these experiments with photons or with matter waves. So if you look at uh, nonlinear optics or quantum optics, the uh, people study an entangled photons in quantum optics. One example is here, entangled photons created using four wave mixing in a hot vapor cell. So there, there's a heated vapor here, in this case rubidium, a pump and probe beam is injected. And then through the interaction with the atoms, entangled photons are being generated. So uh, compare that to the entangled atoms we are generating via collisions. So the mechanism is different. In the optics case, these are generated via four wave mixing in a hot cell. In our case, they are generated, the entanglement is generated via spin exchange collisions in the ultra cold gas. In the four case, the undepleted pump approximation usually holds, which means that the pump is much more intense and the beams coming out are much, much less intense. In the uh, BEC, that is not uh, almost never the case. So in our case, the M equals zero atoms quickly deplete and almost can be converted almost completely into plus and minus one atoms. So this is the difference between the two systems. Another difference is the interrogation time. So the entangled, uh, the photons only pass through the cell in a few nanoseconds or so, or less than a nanosecond. But in the BEC, we can hold the atoms for tens of, for several seconds in our trap and they can keep colliding and creating entangled pairs. 
in the BEC, we also have some other, uh, we have some other benefits in the BEC, which is one is we have a high resolution due to the small size of the BEC. And though if we compare these two systems, although there are some differences, there are many similarities. And exploiting these similarities between the quantum optics with photons and quantum optics with atoms, we can uh, use what people have done. So we can implement techniques such as homodyne detection, heterodyne detection, parametric amplification, and all of these experiments that have already been done in, with photons, and we can try to implement them with atoms. And then making use of the difference between the two systems, we hope to gain something from this, right? And so in uh, entangled photons, you would put beam splitters, mirrors, and so on to implement your experiment. In the case of atoms, the beam splitters and mirrors uh, are replaced with microwave and RF pulse sequences. Here is how these two systems look in the energy levels. So four wave mixing with photons. Here we have two pump photons being absorbed and converted into a probe and conjugate. And in the uh, spin system, we see the energy level diagram from before. And here's how it looks, the generation of squeezing looks. So squeezing it with entangled photons is usually plotted in the uh, in terms of electric field quadratures in phase space where we have the X and P quadratures and a coherent state which has a circular um, uncertainty distribution is then squeezed as becoming an ellipse. Well, squeezing of spins in the atomic system is done on the block sphere. So we can describe the spin on the block sphere. And again, a coherent spin state can be squeezed into an ellipse or the circle here in this case from this reference. Um, we can understand the theory of the spin squeezing here in the atomic system by doing uh, looking at the um, Hamiltonian and here in this case, our wave function. So what I did here is I made the single mode approximation to look at the spinner order parameter. The spinner, uh, okay, there's a spatial dependence I factored out, assuming they are always perfectly overlapping the different spin states in the trap. And I get populations here in the spinner. This is a three component vector that has three phases and three populations. Then uh, what is usually done is that a spinner phase is defined as the relative phase between the plus minus one pairs and the zero atoms. Now, um, for long evolution times, this wave function will evolve on the block sphere. If, if we think of it as a distribution on the block sphere, this will evolve and um, eventually after uh, Long evolution time here means that the time is larger than the about, in our case, the interaction for the collisions, which is about 30 Hertz. So after several tens of milliseconds, the Bogoliubov approximation will break down, the undepleted pump approximation will break down. And we found also the truncated Wigner approximation will break down. And uh, an initial coherent spin state will then evolve into much more exotic states, such as spin pneumatic squeeze, spin squeezed, and later at longer times, non-Gaussian squeeze states. So again, there's, this is a difference to the photonic system. So with this wave function, well, we can also look at the Hamiltonian then. So the spin Hamiltonian using only the spin component and making the single mode approximation again looks like this. So we have an F square term here. This is the nonlinear interaction term that generates entanglement. And we have this quadratic Zeeman effect term. This is the term that shifts the energy levels and allows us to have control. So Q here is given by this shift due to the magnetic field and microwave dressing. Uh, interaction energy is typically about 30 Hertz in our BEC, sometimes 18 Hertz, depending on the atom number and density here. Um, and if I take this operator and write it out, this is the two axis twisting Hamiltonian. Notice there's no Z here. It's just the full um, F. So if I write that out, I can find the four wave mixing terms here. These are terms raising and lowering operators that destroy zero atoms and create plus minus one atoms and vice versa. But I also see extra terms that are not present in the usual quantum optics description with light. Those are the density density terms shown here. Well, excuse me. So what yes. is the justification to ignore the linear Zeeman effect here? The linear Zeeman effect is ignored because we are in the pair basis and we are already putting in a few conservation laws, such as conservation of magnetization. So that always in, in this basis, always only pairs are created between plus and minus one atoms. Oh, you, your initial state is that all particles are in the MF equal to zero state. 
Uh, that is not necessarily true. We can use this formalism also to describe uh, the other initial states because, um, uh, yes. So you are right that there is another term I omitted here that should be included in the full description, which is the linear Zeman effect. Mm -hmm. Because once yes. a linear Zeman effect is there, basically where all these three states will acquire different dynamic phase factors. So I'm not sure whether or not uh, yeah, this may affect your later discussions. One possibility might be that you started from a particular initial state and then okay, the effect of Zeman, linear Zeman effect uh, just give you overall phase factor, then it, it's not important. Yeah, it depends. I think, um, yes, but it's usually in all uh, descriptions I've seen, usually the linear Zeman effect is omitted. I think even if you have that one phase oscillating rapidly, I don't think it makes a difference. Um, but yeah. This F squared term here, it seems like all the phase terms will cancel because they, they consider this model. Yeah. I think, I think it, uh, uh, I think there are effects from the linear Zeman effect, but they are uh, subtle, so. Okay. okay thanks. I, I would just go on, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, with this, uh, with this um, Hamiltonian, so if, if we agree that for now we can do this, okay, with the, without the linear Zeeman effect, then we can find this semi-classical energy. Um, so what is done here is, uh, this is going one step further in the approximations, apart from the few I've, I've mentioned already, approximations that were done here, we are now approximating the operators to be complex numbers and then finding a semi-classical energy. So this was done in 2005 in this paper here. And uh, then we get this uh, energy where there is a magnetic term and a collisional term. And this allows us to construct a semi-classical, uh, some kind of phase space to describe, to get some intuition about the system. We have two dynamical variables, the M0 population function rho naught and the spin-off phase. We also have parameters, the magnetic field, the collisional energy and the magne initial magnetization, which is uh, conserved. Um, now, this is expected to only describe the system accurately when none of the populations are close to zero or one or two atom, uh, f uh, atoms or something, right? Because here we assumed that the operators are complex numbers. But keeping that in mind, we can gain some intuition. If we plot the phase space, it becomes the, phase, uh, the energy as a function of these two dynamical variables. We uh, get the um, a pendulum here. So this is a momentum shortened pendulum um, and we can, we can see running phase solutions here in this, uh, for these energy contours, these are constant energy contours here. We have bound phase solutions here, and then we have a separatix separating these two uh, types of motion, if you want, of this effective pendulum. Um, by the way, for sodium, this is a hill for uh, rubidium because there's a sign difference in the interaction, Th this hill becomes a valley. So the ground state is different between the two elements. There's a connection here. If you look at this phase space, this looks very much like the Josephson phase space with this I in the center, right? But it's a bit different because there's no negative uh, row naught. But there is a connection to the Josephson effect. This uh, system, sometimes the uh, collisional evolution is also described as the bosonic Josephson effect. So with this phase space picture now, we can understand a little bit the, what, we, what we are doing here. If we change Q to be, if we start with all atoms in M equals zero and we change to Q to be positive, then the phase space starts, uh, becomes uh, like this, right? So because the phase space depends on Q, the energy contours. And now we have created a dynamical instability. And now the evolution is driven by vacuum fluctuations. So we start up here and we move on the separatrix, okay? Now, this, the classical system would be described by a point in this phase space. The quantum system will be described by some kind of distribution that will distort as it moves along here in this kind of truncated Rigner picture, right? It will distort and become squeezed in various directions as it moves along these, along these contours. So this brings me to the interferometer. So in the optics case, the SU11 quantum enhanced interferometer looks somewhat like this. We have some kind of vapor cell here, another vapor cell here, and entangled pairs are generated and put uh, uh, reversed um, bounced back with mirrors and the phase shift is applied to reverse the interaction there. 
In our case, this would look something like this. We start with M equals zero atoms. Gen uh, entangled pairs are created. Some kind of phase shift is applied, and they are recombined. In phase space, it looks like this. Here, I plot the system as a point, but keep in mind, it really is the distribution. The system starts to evolve on the separatrix. We uh, change the microwave dressing to cause a phase jump to reverse, approximately reverse the dynamics. It will keep moving on this contour and be moved back up and be reversed. Now, in optical four-wave mixing, a pi phase shift always reverses the dynamics. But in, in the atomic system, it almost never exactly reverses the dynamics because, of, because we are leaving, rapidly leaving the undepleted pump approximation. You can see that here, the distance you need to push this dot on the phase space becomes different depending on how long we let it evolve. Okay, here's then this pendulum analogy for the interferometer. So we start with the pendulum being in uh, inverted quantum fluctuation, cause it to go. Then we give it a kick with our microwave dressing and it bounces back. And, and then any deviation from this perfect bouncing back uh, motion would be a signal. Here's the picture I usually uh, look at, uh, how I usually draw it for the atoms um, with the yellow sodium atoms here. So now we want to ask the question, can we have quantum enhancement when there is large numbers of, arms, uh, of atoms in the arms of the interferometer? And what happens if we put some um, atoms here initially, some kind of population here? Can we maybe speed up the, um, the interferometer and so on? I'm asking these questions um, here. And uh, I should mention that the interferometer in the, for very low um, populations in the arms with about one and a half atoms in the arms of the interferometer has been done by Markus Obertaler in Heidelberg. And they have shown the quantum enhancement that they could get a sensitivity below the standard quantum limit. Um, the first thing we did is try to um, understand this theoretically. So we did some, uh, some kind of brute force numerical calculations. Um, to understand if there can be quantum enhancement. So we applied the truncated Wigner approximation, found that it uh, breaks down in terms of describing the standard deviations of the um, populations here for longer evolution times. And then also did a, in that sense, quantum evolution of the system using a uh, large matrix uh, diagonalization. Okay, we, uh, we simulated the interferometer sequence here. This is just some detail. Here are some example sequences. So we let the um, plus minus one pairs uh, cre become created over time, apply a phase shift, then look at the result after some time here at the output of the interferometer as a function of this phase shift applied here. We find that for large evolution times, at least in our calculations, the interferometer fringes become non-sinusoidal. So here is an output of the interferometer as a function of applied phase shift for low of short evolution time, it is sinusoidal. For longer evolution times can become highly distorted. This makes sense because this now is turned turn this interferometer into a kind of nonlinear measurement. So we can have uh, enhanced slopes in the interferometer fringes and hopefully at the same point also reduce standard deviations to give us an, a, an enhancement in the sensitivity. Of course, that should dip below the standard quantum limit as shown here. In this sensitivity plot here versus phase, the lower means better in our case. So that's just how the sensitivity is um, defined. Well, I'm very sorry. So, okay, I, yes. I, I, I got a little bit lost, okay. Sorry, okay. Yes. So what have you exactly done okay, uh, using this in the fiometer? I have understood that at the beginning, you suddenly quench your magnetic field, okay, such that, well, okay, okay basically, yes. well, particles occupying MF equal to zero, we are Experience this pairing scattering, and then they will get occupy plus one or minus one. Then what are you going to do later? So you are going to sequence, I, I skipped over it uh, in, uh, because I was looking at my watch. So I will explain it to you quickly. So we start with all atoms in M equals zero. That can be done by cleaning out using resonant light and microwave pulses. Then we can, uh, if we want, we can put seed uh, atoms. This is like a seeding here using microwave pulses into the plus one and minus one states. Mm -hmm. That happens quickly using a sequence of four pulses. Okay, then we let the uh, system evolve. The collisions will uh, populate the arms of the interferometer. Then we add a phase shift using a rapid quick switching of the microwaves 
to a, um, a high Q, right? So a large Q for a short time, one less than one millisecond or so, or one millisecond. Then we wait the uh, same time again, and then evaluate the populations at the output. So this okay. added this phase of phi is added to to which state? I'm a little bit confused. The phase phi here is the uh, so-called spinner phase, which is the relative phase between plus minus one atoms and zero atoms. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So, so that can be done by applying a phase to either one of the three states. The spin-off phase will change as soon as we apply some phase anywhere here. Mm -hmm. In our case, it is done by shifting the MF equals zero energy relative to the plus and minus one to create that relative phase between the pairs. That's, mm -hmm. all, that's all that matters here. I see. Hmm. Yeah. The thing is, it's not uh, for, for a approximate reversal compared to the optics case, it doesn't have to be pi exactly. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's very similar to the optics case, photon case, right? So uh, I hope I explained that better now. And mm -hmm. then, so, so that's, what, that's what we get. So I, I don't yes, want to spend too uh, much time. Yes. Uh, N plus here means the, uh, the sum of the population in N. Exactly. Yes. N plus means the sum. So what we did is by doing this calculation for many different um, um, initial states, different seeds, and different evolution times, and finding the optimum phase shift that, that, that gives the highest sensitivity. So in that sense, this interferometer will have to be tuned to the optimum operating point where, the, where basically the sensitivity is largest. So that's something we did in the, theory, in, in, in the calculation. We found that we can go below the standard quantum limit still even uh, for long evolution time and some and some seeding, okay. So 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 this gives gives us some uh, 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 hope that this will work. I have a few more uh, things here. Um, basically, if you are interested in more details, this is the publication here where we where we published this year, last year. Just the calculation, okay. numerical uh, calculation. A very good question here. In your seeding here, are these seedings coherent population or they can be defaced? The seeding is incoherent in the sense that there's no entanglement uh, between the seeds. So um, the, the, the seed is just an initial um, uh, number we put in these, in these states, right? Because our basis is the basis of, of um, Fox states. So everything is expanded in Fox states. So we are putting a certain number in, in the in 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 the um, different state, and then what we did in our calculation, which is described in this paper, we we did put in the uh, uncertainty, right? So that they are that the number is not is not exact. So 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 there is there is basically in the calculation different atom numbers are con are considered. Because when you apply a microwave pulse, you will basically create a coherent state. So, so in other words, okay, the seeds are coherent, but there's no entanglement initially, of course. But they are coherent, coherent okay. states. Okay. So we are starting from a coherent state. So it has the square root of um, n uncertainty in it. Yes, very good. Okay. And now I want to I want to switch to the um, experimental realization of that. So we start with our atoms in the mod, uh, create the BEC with about thirty thousand atoms. Our trap frequencies are here. So because it's a it's a cross trap, the trap frequencies are similar to each other. One is slightly larger, square root of two factor, because of this uh, vertical direction being a bit different in in the symmetry of the trap. Okay, so then experimentally we prepare the state uh, by um, blowing away the plus minus one atoms first to clean out. And then we apply, an, in this case, a radio frequency pulse to seed plus and minus one. So the seeding can be done with microwaves, as I explained earlier, but there's also a simpler way if you're interested in having the same seed in, in both um, plus and minus one, if you want dual seeding, you can actually apply an RF pulse, a resonant RF pulse to do that. So in our How experiments, that was a bit easier. How big do you need your C to be? A few percent of the... A few percent, yeah. We have explored a few percent seeds. Yeah. 
Um, basically, we wanted to explore the seeded interferometer and the long evolution time limit. So af after the uh, seeding, we do the quench. So in, in my quench picture here, the seed is not shown. And then we let the system, then we look at the uh, time after quench, what happens. Okay, so the first thing we observed is, by the way, this is preliminary data. So this is uh, in, in, uh, in preparation. Um, so we get uh, uh, coherent spin oscillations here. And as we change the seed, the oscillations indeed become faster. And so that's the red is, is lower seed and black is larger seed here. So this is plotting the fraction of m equals zero atoms as a function of time after quench. We also see the effect of microwave dressing. So if we change Q, then also it affects the spinner evolution that's shown here. Again, m equals zero fraction versus time after quench. As we increase Q, the oscillation becomes faster. Then we wanted to put it, we want to put it together to the interferometer. So again, this is just the experimental sequence here, some details. And here's an interferometer fringe that we measured. So we have the uh, fraction m equals zero as a function of applied phase shift. So this is at the output of the interferometer after the sequence as we change the phase. We see this non-sinusoidal interferometer fringe, which shows some enhancement here in the sense that the slope is increased. So these places are where we would expect enhanced phase sensitivity. We also compare this then to the um, short evolution time, which is shown here on the left, where they, we got a sinusoidal fringe. Our theory is shown here on the right. So for this non-sinusoidal fringe, our theory is shown in red and you see there's some discrepancy. There's some qualitative agreement, but also some discrepancy. Qualitative agreement in the sense that the enhanced slope seems to be there in the theory, but there seems to be a lump there that's, that's different, a, a maximum, another local minimum that's different. Um, another thing to notice is that our error bars are still quite a bit larger than the uh, theoretical prediction. This tells us that we are currently limited by technical noise, but we are getting close to the quantum noise, to the predicted quantum noise. So with a little bit more work on vibrational, uh, um, basically in isolation and so on, I think we can get to the quantum uh, limit of the noise. So this is in preparation preparation and was presented as a talk last year at DayMob also. Okay, I want to uh, press on uh, to show you some other results. We have also investigated together in a collaboration with uh, uh, NIST, with Paulette, we have investigated there a phase sensitive amplifier. The idea there is to start the system with some seed and now we can con apply a phase shift to the seed. Right? And depending, uh, basically, we apply a phase shift with a seeded system at the very beginning instead of in the middle of, of the interferometer sequence. So then we turn this into a phase sensitive amplifier. Depending on the phase that we apply before we let the system evolve, we get either amplification or nothing. So we see here, if we have a, a single 1% seed, we get the blue line, which here is the... Um, output of the amplifier, so after some evolution, 14 milliseconds of evolution, if we start with a single seed, we get a phase insensitive amplifier. If we start with a dual seed, which is the black curve, we get a phase sensitive amplifier. So the output depends on the phase we put between seed and m equals zero, basically the relative phase. This was done for 36,000 atoms. Um, there is some shot to shot noise on the, there's some number fluctuation. And uh, more interesting, I think, is if we look at how uh, much amplification we get. So shown here is the output um, um, uh, after how much the seed is amplified as a function of the seed of the initial seed. So uh, what we can see here is we get amplification, the black curve. So um, if you look at where we start to see the black curve here deviate from its uh, limit at, for no seed. If you look at where this is, this is at about 10 to minus four, at a seed of 10 to minus four, where we see some output on the amplifier. And this corresponds to initially just having 3.6 atoms. So we see here that we can amplify basically three seed atoms to a large macroscopically large signal that we can observe 
This was done with a regular pixel fly um, CCD camera, nothing special, but the uh, signal was amplified that much. So depending on the initial phase, we can here detect a few atoms by letting the system amplify this to a large macroscopic number. So that's the take home message there. Um, then recently we have also looked at beyond single spatial mode dynamics. So what happened here is that in our experiment, we saw some deviation with the, os with the spinner oscillation, which is the generation of pairs going back and forth between the two states, started to show some baseline drift and other um, behavior that was not explained by this single mode uh, theory I showed you earlier, this F squared Hamiltonian. And so then in a collaboration with Dr. Blume here, a theorist here at OU, we decided to investigate this some further and found some in some a bit, little bit further and found that there are resonances here where the spin is resonantly coupled to the spatial um, mode, which is the spatial structure of the BEC. So the explanation is then here, I took out the one slide with the explanation, which shows the trapping potential. And if the, um, if the um, Q setting, which is the, the pair detuning for the two colliding atoms becomes resonant with one of the higher lying oscillator levels in the trap, then we can populate these spatial modes. Of course, energy still has to be conserved. So there will be an mm -hmm. imbalance of the atom numbers in the different spin states. So this is the explanation here that we can see these resonances and we can tune Q to this resonance or away from it, the quadratic Zeeman shift. Here is the experiment and uh, theory comparison. So if we are away from one of these resonances with our Q setting, we let the system go. In this case, we actually started with half the atoms in zero and 25% in plus and minus one. Then we let the system go if we are with Q away from the resonance, the, um, okay, we have here the um, mean field SMA theory and we have the um, experimental data in red. So blue is mean field theory, experimental data is in, is in red. And they, the theories, uh, and then we have in green, the coupled gross petrovsky beyond single mode approximation theory. So as we are, if we are off resonance, all of these, uh, theories and experiment agree pretty well. But if we get close, if we go on to the resonance, then we see that the experimental data has this baseline drift that goes up and this other kind of behavior that is not explained by the single mode theory anymore, which is blue, but starts to be explained by the green theory, which is a coupled gross Petrovsky equation theory done by Dörte Blume's group here at OU um, that allows spin and spatial degrees of freedom to couple. So because this agrees, that gives us basically confidence that this coupled gross petrovsky equation theory can capture some of the dynamics that we have seen that was not captured by the, simple, by the single mode approximation. Um, so the theory was published here in this paper uh, this year. And uh, then we, uh, the experimental results are submitted to PRA, but not yet published we can also see in the experimental results another indicator of these resonances, and that is in the images. So shown here are the uh, Dörte Blumes group calculations of the M equals zero um, um, simulation and the plus and minus one uh, spatial density simulation. And then we have an image here. So if we compare these, we get the, uh, the Gaussian shape for the M equals zero that agrees with the theory qualitatively. And then we also see these kind of distorted shapes, these bimodal type shapes that agree with the theory as well. Those are the higher order spatial modes. And this was submitted to Physical Review A this uh, year. Okay, I think, I'm, how much time do I have? Am I out? It looks like it's 55. You still can have like close to five minutes. I think. Okay, I have five minutes, but I want some uh, have time for questions. Okay, then quickly, let me show you a bit of an outlook. So currently we are working on towards probing, probing our BEC with quantum states of light. So in addition to the spin squeezing and entanglement inside the BEC, we now want to come in with entangled uh, pairs of photons too. So for that, we have started with, in a collaboration with Alberto Marino's group here. He does nonlinear optics. So we have started to build we, or we have built a four-wave mixing setup to generate entangled beams of yellow photons to interact and to probe our BEC 
with quantum light. This is the experimental setup and a picture of it here. Um, it's almost working, but we are still not quite there yet. We, we are a little bit above the shot noise. So here is the noise uh, uh, noise measured, uh, the, the, the intensity noise measured as a function of frequency with a spectrum analyzer in the setup shown here for the, for the detection setup. And uh, if we take the probe noise or the conjugate noise by themselves, then uh, they are quite large. But if we take the differential noise, it gets close to the shot noise, which is shown in red here. So I think with a little bit more work on that, we can generate squeezing there. Then we have two beams of squeezed light. We can have one interfere with the BEC and look at, for example, quantum enhanced phase contrast imaging or probing of the populations. And then we are also working towards studying Wittberg impurities in the system. So we want to excite Wittberg atoms and look at the effect of such an impurity on the spin, uh, spin uh, oscillation period and amplitude and so on. For that, we need to verify, not only do we have to excite Wittberg atoms with a blue laser, which we have built, but we also need to verify whether an impurity was present or not. We will do that using a pulse field ionization spectrometer. Our design is shown here, but it's not built yet. So we are, we are now building it and testing it to insert into our uh, experimental chamber and allow us to do Wittberg experiments in the system. That brings me to the conclusion. So I, I hope I could convince you that metawave quantum optics is an exciting field that allows us to do things similar to quantum optics with photons, but with, with many similarities, but also some differences and uh, allows us to implement devices from quantum optics with photons, but with atoms. I showed three examples a, our work towards, I should say, a SU11 atom interferometer in the long evolution time limit for quantum enhanced sensing, a phase sensitive amplifier that we have implemented in, 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 with NIST and beyond a single spatial mode dynamics we have recently observed. So I think these are just some of the results on this work that in the future will be very useful for quantum technologies such as BC based sensors microwave sensors and B-field sensors. Now we are working on interfacing the BEC with quantum states of light. We plan to study impurities to uh, um, better understand realistic effects in real devices. It will allow us the impurities we can uh, uh, excite in there and hopefully understand things such as decoherence, controlled losses and so on. And in the long term, we want to establish this as a prototyping platform because it's very well controlled to study quantum technologies. Okay, that's the end of my talk. I want to end with the people. So here's the research group, graduate students, Jimin Zhang, Sean Zhang, Isaiah uh, uh, Morgenstern, and Hyo Gyab Oi, and our collaborators here, Aite Tiesinger at NIST, Dr. Bloom at OU, John Fano at OU, and Alberto Marino at OU. And of course, students from their groups collaborated with our group and some former graduate students here. The undergraduate students I also listed that have worked in the lab there. And then I want to end with the acknowledgements for the funding by NSF and DOD. Okay, thank you very much. I think there might be one minute for questions. Oh, it's okay. We can have uh, some time um, more than one minute for a couple more okay. questions. Thank you very much, Arm. Uh, so uh, we're welcome for the questions from the audience. Yeah, I have a simple question. I'm an engineer, so I'm very interested in the applications of such a thing. But it seems that like your system is very bulky and needing, needing a lot of cryogenics. And you, you purport to use it for biosensors or magnetic fence, uh, sensors. Yes. How are you going to do that in practice if you have such a bulky system to use so, the sensors? I don't think, uh, I don't really want to do that, but, it, but people have done that. So there is a push at, in companies even industrial. So, so one of the things that has been done, you might be aware that recently there was a big collaboration between uh, Germany and the US, uh, Europe and the US to put a BEC in space. So they took this whole big apparatus I've shown you with all the lasers and everything and put it into this ruggedized, you know, a few feet by a few feet kind of rectangle cube and send it into space. And it worked on the space station. The astronauts just had to plug in a few things, turn a knob, and now they can control BEC creation in space here from the ground. So uh, I think um, Nick Bigelow from Rochester was one of the people involved. And he said it was the most expensive knob he ever pushed. Because every time he pushes the knob to create a BEC, it basically costs like, I don't know how many thousands of dollars. But it works. So, so that is being done. So here's some more pictures of how they put, put this thing on the, on the launch vehicle 
and how it looks. So that has been done. Another thing that has been done is cold atom systems. So the laser cooling and, and trapping and everything has been, um, is being miniaturized. So there's a company called uh, MicroSemi that has done a chip scale atomic clock. So they got an atomic clock into this tiny chip, um, um, you know, uh, microchip. And they are working on doing a mod like that. So they have a little chip. There's a pyramid mirror and a diode laser integrated, a mini vacuum chamber, right? And it's all, it's like a few centimeters. They want to have a magneto optical trap in a few centimeters. And then I think it's only a matter of time until we have chips with complete BECs on them. But I don't want to do that. So I think that's up, that is really, companies are al already interested in that and working on that. Thank Can you. I ask a question? Yes. Um, your, uh, this is about your, uh, it's a very naive question. It's about your interferometer. Uh, and I, I want to understand physically what plays the role of the mirrors and the beam splitter in your interferometer? In my, in my current interform, I don't have the picture for this. In the current interferometer, the atoms are always overlapping. So that, that is a difference to the photonic case where automatically when the photons come out, you see in the optics case, because of the way the four wave mixing is set up with the face matching condition and so on, there's a small angle between the, uh, between the outgoing beams. I'm trying to get there. And in my system, that angle is at the moment is uh, by default, not there, right here. So in my system, the, the atoms are always overlapping. Okay. So they're in the same spatial mode. So in that sense, there I don't need mirrors. I just need to apply. Um, I need to, however, apply this phase shift that's shown here in the center. So this is still needed. But the mirrors are not needed because the think of the beams as already overlapping on top of each other. Right. Okay. However, we are working now on a new project to actually on purpose separate the, the states because then we can do it, do gra gravimetry with it. We can sense accelerations and gravitational fields, but we have to do that on purpose, coming in with laser beams and actually separating the atoms. So, so the phase shifting is kind of like applying a time reversal or something like that to the... Yes, the function. phase shift we are doing now is doing this uh, pi, which is the time approximate time reversal, but it's only approximate. That's when we, why we went through these numerics. Right. Because um, you can see that from here, once you evolve on this phase space, you know, you're distorting and a time reversal should mirror this distribution, but a phase shift can only translate it oh. in this phase space. And then you are not mirroring it. So it's a, it's an approximate uh, reversal. Yes. So, so what plays the role of the beam splitter? The beam splitter here, this in no, this no, interferometer. The, the, the one at the detector. This one? Yeah. This is just the, uh, this, uh, so here, think of these as two active beam splitters, which are vapor cells when interaction takes place. So here's the first interaction, then another reversed interaction. For me in the BEC, the interaction happens all the time. So in, in, in some sense, I have a very large beam splitter here and another very large beam splitter here. And only the phase shift in between causes them two to do different things. But they're really the same, the same cell, the same BEC. There's no, yes. there's no spatial... Uh, very at the moment, no. Okay, so we want fine. to do that, but at the moment, it's all happening inside the cell, and the the uh, collisions are always taking place. So we okay, can't leave okay. the we can't leave the vapor cell in the in the quantum optic sense. Good, good. Now, then, I just have a, a one other question, which is, um, to what extent is this characterizing or quantifying the degree of entanglement? Oh. At the moment, not at all. So I think what, because we are not there yet. So to quantify the entanglement, one way um, is to just show uh, that we go below in our sensitivity. So we would have to measure the uh, response to a phase shift and then uh, calculate the sensitivity and, and dip below the standard quantum limit. Of course, that is not easy because of technical noise. Then you can take out the technical noise saying, uh, assuming that it's like a detector inefficiency, right? We cannot count the atoms perfectly. But even then you would have to show that, right? So we are not there yet to actually show that. Another way to characterize entanglement has al already been done in the system. Let me see if I can get there. Um, there is a way to measure the entanglement uh, just directly, basically, either doing state tomography or doing some average measurements. So this is from uh, Dave Weinland, the uh, spin squeezing parameter. So that can be measured. 
So if you look at this, so the idea is that there's a parameter. If this is smaller than one, then you have proven there's entanglement. So this is a, a, a measurement that measures the uncertainty of the spin in one direction divided by the uh, expectation value in another direction. How is okay. this done? This can be done by applying microwave or RF rotations of our spin to align the spin with our detection axis before the stern gerlach separation, and then measuring either the mean value for one of these rotations, or then for the other one, the standard deviation, which is just accumulating data and looking at the, dis at the standard deviation of the distribution. Then we could prove there is entanglement. There's an experiment by... Um, by uh, Carsten Klemt from, I think it was done in Hamburg a couple of years ago, where they sh have shown that this system indeed creates twin meta waves and they have demonstrated there's entanglement in a rubidium system. But it wasn't that easy either. either. They needed a lot of statistics. So there were thousands of measurements. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Hey, um, maybe I can ask, if there might be the last question. So your Paper has a title antiferromagnet because you use sodium, but is that really important? It seems you this is mostly related to the two, you know, to spin conversion process, the antiferromagnet aspect. I don't um, I usually put it in the title to distinguish it from the rubidium work because uh, there is a difference in the sign in the C parameter in the Hamiltonian, which changes the role of the valleys and hills in the phase space. So there is a difference and there's a much bigger difference because if you look, I don't have the slide for it, but if you look, there's quantum phase trans transitions in the system. And if you look where the quantum phase transitions are for certain cues, if you slowly change Q, you can tune to a quantum phase transition where basically the ground state changes from being zero to plus minus one or something like that. And where the quantum phase transitions are also changes depending on whether you work with sodium and rubidium. So I'm always careful to put that in there, but you're right that qualitative they are very similar. But if you look at the details, really, there are some profound differences. Yeah, I'm just saying this interferometer, uh, all this uh, also, okay. can also... Yes, of course. The The first demonstration for the 1.5 atoms in the arms was done by Obertaler in Heidelberg with rubidium, not sodium. Yes, that can be done. And in fact, once you go to uh, like this... Uh, yeah, and yeah, yes, so in that sense... Because there's a sign in the C in the in that C parameter, but you can do the calculations for either case and find quantum enhancement. Yeah. Okay. And, and that time scale tau, which is the time scale to convert for kind of, I guess for one it's cycle different. zero zero to one plus one. How long is that time scale in your case? Um, it's. Uh, let me see if I have the picture here. I was. Uh, oh, in our case, that was about. Um, it's about. Um, 20 milliseconds or so, depending on the exact atom number. So after a few tens of milliseconds, all the atoms are converted. Um, uh, Your reverse, I mean, this is clarified, well, related to the Steve's question about interferometer. Your, your reverse arm is really the reverse conversion from plus minus one back to zero, zero. Ideally, it should be that, but it is only approximate, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why the, the numerics, but um, the, the, the poles, to apply this reversal, to apply this phase shift is short compared to the tens of milliseconds evolution time. So it, we try to keep it much shorter than one milliseconds. It's a few hundred microseconds or something to, to keep everything simple because of course the collisions can happen during that pulse. Um, I should mention that there is another important difference between sodium and rubidium and that is sodium is much lighter. And when we actually start doing light pulse interferometry where we separate the states, now that, that becomes important because sodium is so light, we can do a very short pulse with low uh, intensity and still get a large separation of the clouds. So I think having sodium will help us in that respect too. But we, ha we haven't tried that yet. All right. There are no other questions. Well, thank you very much again, Al, for the very interesting talk. And I'm you, sure- No, this... actually I have a question. So. Okay, that's one, please. Yes. Okay. So, Within the approximation, within the single mode approximation, essentially the whole problem can be solved uh, fully quantum mechanically. Okay, basically we just have uh, once we ignore the excitation in the, in the special degree freedom, okay, we only have three internal degrees of freedom, and this problem can be solved uh, quantum mechanically. So I'm wondering what is the reason for you to choose uh, the semi-classic approach? 
the semi-classical approach was just shown here for an illustration. I like it because it gives me something to think about. It shows yeah. me the space space and I can think of the trajectories. But I think you are right. There's no other, there's no need for it. So of course, if you use the semi-classical approach, calculations become very easy. And it is, it is used for the truncated Wigner approximation because the truncated Wigner approximation takes an, in that approximation, we take a um, ensemble in this phase space and evolve it, right? So, but, but we've already seen that that breaks down pretty quickly. So yeah, I don't think there's, there's really a reason uh, apart from gaining some intuition maybe that you can think of these trajectories and things, and maybe it will also help visualize uh, on this phase space. Um, I should mention that I didn't mention that that phase space I showed, I, I hope I can get to it. Um, if you look at these phase spaces, there's, uh, there's a, a simplification there because uh, on the, this has been, uh, this has been shown by, um, by uh, Chap, uh, Mike Chapman in his paper on spinematic squeezing a couple of years ago, because we are talking, this is really a spins. They, they should be described, even visualized on the block sphere for the F equal one system. It's not like the F equal one half system where there's one block sphere that describes the whole state. For the F equal one system, there's multiple block spheres, multiple subspaces, because there's the three spin operators, but there's also the spin nematic operators Q, because everything is a three by three matrix. The Pauli matrices are not enough anymore to describe the full space. So that means that this phase space is really a, is, is really a flattening out of the block of one block sphere you could also look at this from above and that's what Chapman has done and they have found squeezing there. So even before the evolution happens, there can be squeezing on the very top um, that is not just shown here in this phase space. And then there's even more block spheres we should also consider. That's so, true. If the reasons that I mentioned uh, um, okay, a, fully quantum mechanic, uh, a fully quantum mechanical treatment might provi provide us uh, with more information, more directly, much information more directly. So much more, yes. Yeah. I think this is just. I like to put this cartoon as a as a, to gain some intuition. But you're right. It is uh, that's uh, something that also happened when we talked to Dr. Bloom. She's like, this is just wrong. Don't do. It. Why even bother? It's true. It's a quantum mechanical system. We should describe it quantum mechanically. Unless yeah, you know, right. it's the real the real reason I asked this question is that I'm wondering. Whether or not there's uh, there's some technical issues there, okay, that uh, okay, introduces some kind of decoherence, such as that, uh, well, okay, then, okay, then we have to make use of a semi-classical approach instead of uh, the quantum approach. Okay. Yeah, I think that you can describe losses very easily in the classical approach, but they can also be described in the quantum approach. You know, you just uh, it is possible. I, th I think that's possible too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things is there was some initial work done um, in the early 2000s, I think, to understand the period and amplitude of the spinner oscillations, spin dynamic oscillations, spin dynamical oscillations, and they found that the semi-classical model does predict the period and amplitude quite well. But then again, even in our work, we showed that baseline drift that's not explained at all. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll officially close seminar. Thanks again, Ann, but uh, a lot of the discussion interested can be continued and you and Chi and others can, can still discuss more, but I think yes, other people please. feel free to log off. Thank you again. Thank well, you, Ann. Thank you. Thank you.